Hi, this is Gershon Wolf, and welcome to Modern Music Composition. <laughs> um, in our previous video, we talked about intervals, and we calculated which intervals were consonant, which ones were dissonant. These were based on mathematical ratios. Um, then I touched briefly, once again, on upon set theory, and I gave an example of um, major and minor triads, that they were both part of set 311 in terms of what set class they're associated with, 311. Um, today we're actually going to prove this. So I've chosen a major triad and I've chosen its parallel minor triad. So we've got C, E, G as the major and C, E flat, G as the minor. Remember that a major triad is defined as the first interval has four semitones, the second interval has three, and over here on the minor, the first interval has three semitones, and the second interval has four semitones. Let's talk about the major triad, and we will calculate its prime form. Let's do that right now. So once again, we've got a graph here with respect to the chromatic scale. I've omitted all notes except for the triad itself, and I've given the nomenclature for the numbering. So first thing we want to do is clockwise traverse the path in a way in which we create the smallest path possible and touch upon each one of the um, notes. So to do that, let's take a look and see what that path is. Well, if I were to start from E and take it up to C, that would be eight semitones, okay? If I were to start from C, and take it to G, that would be seven semitones. If I were to start it from G and take it to E, that would be nine semitones. Well, it's obvious what you want to do is traverse from C to G. That's the shortest path possible, seven semitones. So let's write that out. Zero, four, seven. Well, we don't really know if that's prime form. Okay, to calculate the prime form, what we really want to do is to take what we've now just created normal form for this major triad. We're going to invert this graph and then calculate the normal form of that inversion and compare that with this form and see which one is most compactly um, which one is most compact to the left. So let's do that. So C stays C, because remember in this inversion, we're taking it with respect to the 0, 6 axis, the C, F sharp axis, and flipping it. So E flips over to four position flips over to eight. So now we've got an eight. Seven position flips over to five. So now we've got the zero five eight. Once again, we're gonna find the shortest path possible to traverse these numbers. If I take and I go from C from zero to eight, I'm left with a gap of four, so that gives me eight semitones. If I go from five to zero, um, that gives me seven semitones, and if I go from um, eight to five, I get my nine semitones. Obviously, the thing to do is to go from five to zero, and let's write out what that form is. That's five, eight, zero. Well, I always like to transpose down to zero, so <coughs> I always like to deal with the smallest numbers possible, because that's what you want to do in creating your abstract um, set class, which by the way, small diversion here, um, a set class is an unordered, unordered form of tones, of intervals, okay? But um, it makes, that's why it makes it such a universal set to work with. Anyways, let's continue here. Um, I'm gonna go down five semitones to get me to zero here. So I go zero, eight minus five, 
is 3, and, and 0 is 12, 12 minus 5 is 7. Oh, lo and behold, Z, 0, 3, 7 is compacted more to the left than 0, 4, 7. That's our prime form, and plus, it's sitting right there in front of us. <laughs> Anyways, if we didn't know it, we'd know it now, because now we've done all the work possible to calculate the prime form. So now we have prime form for CEG, the major triad for um, our, our example here. But it's the case for all major triads. And let me just bring that home. Let's go through one more example. Let's choose, randomly choose one. I don't know. A major. A, C sharp, E. So between A and C sharp, we have four semitones. Between C sharp and E, we have three semitones. Right? Let's write that out. It's going to be important that I get these ticks to look nice because we're going to be off axis. Our A is over here at 9. Our C sharp is right here at 1. And our E. is it four. So we've got one, four, nine. Once again, we're going to traverse it. I know this gets tedious, okay? Um, music composition isn't, music composition isn't just about writing these uh, chromatic circles and running around the circles in these blue arrows. <laughs> but just bear with me so that we can get through this and, and, and you'll feel a lot better. Um, I'm gonna just look at this visually and see that um, Going from A to E, um, I've got seven uh, semitones. Going from C sharp to A, I've got eight semitones. And going from E to C sharp, I've got nine. The obvious thing to do is to go from A to E. That gets me seven semitones. Let's write that out. That's nine, one, four. I'm going to, this way, I'm going to transpose up to 12, up to 0 from 9. It makes it easy, so I'm going to go up by 3. So 9, 10, 11, 12 gets me a 0. 1, 2, 3, 4. 4 plus 3 is 7. Okay, now that's starting to look a little familiar with what we've got in the beginning with our major triad before. So let's just be complete about this process. And so we're just going to be doing our inversion. Let me draw a better circle than that. Okay, A transposes over to D, which is 3. C sharp transposes over to B, which is 11. And 4 transposes over to 8, which is uh, G sharp. Okay, well, I'm just going to cut to the chase here <laughs> and bring out the blue marker and trans traverse from 8 to 3 because I can see that that's my shortest path. Let's draw that out. 8, 11, 3. And we'll go up four semitones to get to 12, to get to zero. So I got my zero. Uh, this is, it's, 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 it's a modular arithmetic, mod 12. So if I want to get to zero, I wrap around. It's literally like looking at a 12 hand clock, um, 12 position clock. <laughs> um, so 11, 12, uh, 11, 12, one, two, three. And then three up from four is seven. Oh. Well, kaya yippee yippee yay. <laughs> We've got zero, three, seven, zero, three, seven. So it works for every single major triad.
All right, well, we're not gonna stop here. Because if you're not bored yet, <laughs> then I still have a chance. <laughs> okay, we're gonna calculate what's called its integral um, class vector. And we mentioned this in the previous um, lesson on intervals. Um, basically, the interval uh, class vector is a six position vector in which it has in its first position the minor second, then a major second, and then a minor third, then a major third, um, then a perfect fourth, and a tritone. You only need six because each one of these inversions, for example, a minor second inverts to a major seventh, a, minor, a major second inverts to a minor seventh, those are inversionally equivalent. So you only need six to describe your system. So if I look at CEG, we're going to go back to our example CEG. Let's fill this chart out. Well, this is a very simple example. You know exactly just by looking at it and empirically, it's going to be easy to figure out how many intervals are in this um, uh, major triad. Now, if you had something like five notes or seven notes, how do you know how many uh, you're going to have? Well, you can actually calculate it. There's a formula to calculate. Let me just diverge a little bit. If I have one note, <laughs> let's say I have a C. Well, by default, it has no um, interval. <laughs> okay, so it's let me let me diagram this. It's interval. Um, let's call this. It's actually called, to be specific, it's actually called a cardinal number, okay? There are no birds involved. <laughs> what the cardinal number is, it's simple. It's a very formal way of saying the number of notes or tones associated with your uh, set that you're dealing with. In this case, we're dealing with three. But what if we have a cardinal of one? No intervals. A cardinal of two, it would be zero plus one. A cardinal of three, zero plus one plus two. A cardinal of four, zero, whoops, not a six. It's a zero plus one plus two plus three. So, and it just goes onward and upward. So we know we have three notes, our cardinal is three. We're going to have a maximum of three intervals here for our system. Well, what are they? Well, we know between C and E, we have four semitones. Well, what is that equal to? That's a major third. So we've got here a major third. Between E and G, we have three semitones. That's a minor third. And then we've got between C and G. Well, between C and G, that's seven semitones, okay? Seven semitones is a perfect fifth, but where in here is the inversion of a perfect fifth? Well, it's a perfect fourth, okay? So what is our interval, <laughs> what is our, what does our interval class vector look like for 311? Well, it has no minor seconds. It has no major seconds. It's got one minor third, one major third, one perfect fourth, and no tritones. Lo and behold, there you have it. Well, what can you do with this? Actually, a lot. The first thing we're going to do with it is this is going to tell us which notes survive 
under transposition with respect to these interval positions. Let, let's explain. Let me explain this. So we'll just keep this up. Well, we know this position here is a minor third. Let's take CEG and transpose up a minor third. Well, C up three semitones is E flat. E up three semitones is G. G up three semitones is B flat. Look, one survived. One. That's pretty cool. So this is a very simple example. When this chart, when, when, when it, um, the interval class vector starts to get filled up with a lot of numbers, then that's actually, you can really use this as a tool in composition in terms of creating motifs, switching around your motif, figuring out if you want to transpose your motif a particular way, what notes are going to survive from it. Zeros are important too. Okay, well, let's transpose up a major second. C gets me to a D. E gets me to a G flat. G gets me to an A. Okay, well, lo and behold, none survived. None survived. Okay, well, I really think this is interesting stuff. Working with interval class vectors is a very important tool in composition. And I'm not the only one that thinks that because historically, a lot of the successful composers use the interval class vector in their, in, in, as a tool to help them compose their music. And so, um, there you have it. That's, uh, I think I'm going to cut it for today. That's it. And um, the next segment is going to be the continuation of this. We're going to start looking at more chords. Um, we're not going to stop at uh, these triads. We're going to be looking at seventh chords next. And that's going to be important too because the seventh chord is, 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 the, um, is, is pretty much the first type of chord that is going to start introducing dissonances now. So, um, the triad as written out here, and I don't care if you take inversions of it or not, it's still consonant. And that's why people use seventh chords all the time. And in fact, I'll tell you real quick, <laughs> if you know your triads, and if you know several seventh chords, like um, your minor seventh, major seventh, dominant seventh, diminished sevenths, you've got a toolbox of chords that encompass <laughs> the majority of music that's out there, actually. Um, but anyways, we're not going to be stopping at seventh chords, but that's what we're going to be talking about next. So um, I hope you enjoyed today's lesson, and I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.